Yep, I think that's it. Welcome everyone um, to this, uh, I lost track of which of our sessions this is, but um, this is the second one, I believe, of this term, um, CTEL uh, Econ Teaching Sessions, and you'll see I have my tiger cup, though I'm a coffee drinker rather than a drinker, but anyway, you, you get those. The point, we're uh, at 3 p.m. here in London, so welcome wherever you're joining us from. Uh, we have two speakers from the from the west of us. I'm hoping we have lots of people from the east of us as well. So as you know, today's session is on, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to lose my voice here, teaching gender economics and kind of purposely left the, um, left the, the title kind of open, kind of broad, because this is, if you've been to one of our sessions before, you'll know that it's very much sort of starting the discussion rather than, you know, it, it is a big topic with, with, with lots of things we could talk about. We're not going to be able to talk about everything, but we will want to sort of chat to the people that we have on the panel here to see what they're doing, what they're thinking, and so on. Just some logistics. As you can see, this is streaming on, on YouTube, uh, and it's being recorded as well. Uh, we would love, obviously, for everyone to uh, have their cameras open, but if you're uncomfortable with that for, for the streaming and the recording, that's not a problem at all. There is the chat, which is open. Drop questions, comments in there. Um, my colleague, Cloda, who is one of the co-organizers, uh, is here. She's a chat chair, so she will keep an eye on questions and, and move them to me. Uh, and of course, the panelists, when you have a chance, if you want to, you could answer questions in the chat as well. But I know it can get quite overwhelming, so I'll try to bring the questions in here to, to um, orally ask you as well. So quick introductions before we jump in. Um, so I'm going to go in the order that I have on my screen. So first of all, on our panel, we have Astrid Kunze from, um, she's joining us from Norway. So we, I, I don't think we've had anyone sort of on the panel from, from Norway before. She's from the Norwegian School of uh, Economics. Uh, next on my screen, I have Gunseli Berik from the University of Utah. And huge apologies to Gunseli for how early it might be, must be over there. Uh, and we have Jana Rogers from uh, Rutgers University. Um, a walk on last minute, but very special role uh, by our colleague and, and co-organizer, uh, Stefania Paredes Fuentes from Work University. Um, and she's also here in her role as the Royal Economic Society's diversity champion. So I wanna jump right in by asking um, each of the panelists to tell us a little bit about their work in this area. So Astrid, we can start with you. So congratulations, first of all, on your recent uh, econ uh, European Economic uh, Association Teaching Award, Education Award um, for you. your course, um, teaching about forums and then, you know, things that we teach in economics all the time, but with a gender perspective. So if you can give us about five minutes or so, just telling us about who you teach, what you teach, how you teach, and also a little bit about why. Why did you think that making this change was important? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I uh, was very pleased to receive this prize, this award from the European Economic Association, giving credit to this course, which I find very motivating also to pursue this, because I think courses on diversity in firms don't really exist uh, very much. So if you know of any, I'm very happy to hear but especially teach taught from the economics perspective. So actually the original idea why I got to start these courses 10, about 10, 11 years ago, was that we were discussing at the department and at the business school that we actually don't have a course that more focuses on the input factor labor to the firm's production. And when I thought, think about the input factor labor with my research background, I think of the demographic, characteristics of input factor labor, men, women at the outset, but also more broadly demographics. And so I got to think of what kind of course we can provide new course to the students. And in my research, I focus on gender difference on labor markets, but also on empirical research and labor economists have used large register data and recent decays to look at more causal evidence, time trends, so I want to merge this into this course with a focus on diversity in firms. So you could start thinking, why should we care about diversity in firms? Well, so 
if you look at the corporate world, many firms have it on their front page that they want to have more gender diversity, more diversity in their workforce for reason of firm performance. They believe they are um, better innovators, uh, other firm of performance outcomes. But also I am motivating this in the courses always the students that there are lots of time trends that motivate us to, to look more into the firms and diversity in firms. So first of all, if you think of the time trend in female employment rates, if you go back 40, 50 years, around 40% of women were working. Nowadays, it's up to 60 to 70%. But this means not only that labor markets have changed, but also the firms, the composition of the workforce. The other time trends, like if you think of migration, which also makes the workforce more diverse, but also then I try to address also male students. And so in these courses, the gender balance always a bit different from year to year. But I also try to really activate everybody that this is a, not only from the corporate world. If you think of that, it's a general topic. But also if you think of paternity leave or policies, that incentivize households to more equally uh, share care for children and so forth. And we, especially in Norway, being there, men who were champions in take up of paternity leave and durations. So all this I try to motivate students that from a general interest point of view, but also from uh, their perspective, this is a very interesting area. And there's a lot of empirical, exciting research that gives us more clues on what works in firms. So um, this course is different from other courses, but maybe we get to talk about this later. So there exist more courses on gender economics, which is more from the individual household perspective. So here it's really the firm angle, which makes it different. And it's also different from in management, there are courses on diversity and organizations, which focus more on the organization itself while in my course so on these diversity in firms, it's also taken from the labor economics perspective. So we think of the firm as part of the labor market and also that influences what policies can work to increase diversity in firms that they include also a knowledge about competitive or non-competitive markets and so forth. So I know that I have a one minute to tell you a little bit about the structure of the course. So how I start using the course is to motivate why should we care about diversity? So I discuss empirical evidence, the theory why more gender diversities or more, gen more diversity in firms may lead to more better firm performance outcomes, not only profitability, but innovations, you could think. But then I also confront the students with what do we actually know from the empirical literature, from causal evidence, there's lots of correlations, interesting new data that document how diversity evolves over time, how it's correlated with firm performance. And the corporate world is quite convinced that it's good for business, it's good for them. But then I also show them that if we're really serious about causal evidence, it's actually very few studies so far, so we need more research. But then if it's not a business case, uh, is so far, the causal evidence may suggest that there is maybe not a negative effect, but it's not clearly a positive effect. In some cases, it is. But if it is not a business case, then we still may care, and the firms still care for fairness reasons about diversity. So if you think of the workforce composition, women have caught up in terms of education. After all, women account for 50% of the population. So there could be a equality fairness, ethical, business ethics uh, goal behind that. So that's the first uh, lecture I usually start with and I introduce them to empirical regression lens to, to read empirical outcomes and studies. But then I also teach them some economic principles like labor demand, labor supply, how to think about labor markets, about competitive markets and frictions. How do we think about choice of human capital? How do individuals and how do firms decide whether they invest in building new capital of the employees? And also about discrimination, so how, how differences, unjustified differences may occur in markets. 
And then in the part, main part, applying all this knowledge, we go through empirical evidence, partly theory evidence, uh, theory basis on different topics in diversity. For example, one question is why there are so few women in top positions. So I show them first descriptors across time. Also point highlighting that in Norway, which is ranked among the three most gender equal countries in the world, according to the World Economic Forum indicators, does not score much higher on when it comes to women in top positions. So then we discuss theories, theoretic explanations, why this may be the case, labor demand and labor supply factors. And then I show them empirical evidence. We look critically at studies. What do we know? What do we not know? And discuss this. Then we discuss also policies and how the, whether this works, how they work in firms. Another topic is, for example, parental leave policies, so family policies. So there we start from the policies. I show them also the institutions, so a large part in this course is also to get an international overview, <clears throat> for example, of parental leave policies. US is always the prime example, or UK actually, with low parental leave <laughs> provision, paid parental leave position. On the other end are the Scandinavian countries with almost a year of paid leave. And then we discuss how this affects individual careers. How does it affect mothers' careers, fathers' careers? And this is an interesting topic where then when we come to the firm, the students usually come with the immediate statement, yeah, but this should also affect firms if they have to keep workplaces available for mothers, for fathers, and grant leave, even though they have, don't have to pay because it's finance through taxpayers' money. But then we look at the empirical literature, the research, where actually so far there has been no evidence on that this has more severe influences on the firm behavior. This is an interesting topic where students may have some intuition, but actually empirical evidence doesn't speak to that yet. Or we discuss empirical evidence that confirms their views or supplements. So, so the point is then always to get to the firm and look from the firm's perspective, the manager's perspective. So I'm in the business school, so many of these students go into leading positions. So we can also derive like policies, how should, can managers respond, how can firms respond. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Astrid. Um, I, I should say before we carry on that um, uh, our, our panel today is not really female by design. It happened in this way. However, the fact that exposed it happens is something to think about, perhaps. So I'm going to uh, move on to uh, Gunseli and uh, Jana. Um, I think Gunseli, is, is it you that's going to start? And um, well, I uh, we will be um, talking about our uh, recently published paper on uh, how to integrate um, uh, gender content in a standard undergraduate uh, development economics course in the global north. And um, uh, we believe that an undergraduate course in development economics presents an ideal opportunity to introduce students to the importance of gender differences in economic outcomes. And um, economic development textbook typically used in the global north meet this challenge in a partial and limited way. Um, uh, for this project, we reviewed two um, widely used textbooks and, uh, and we notice uh, and we document in our paper that they use, um, uh, they uh, talk about gender inequality in the context of a small number of topics. And uh, typically they do so in sort of side boxes. Uh, and so the, the, so the main text is really not gender aware, but these are sort of side complementary um, boxes. So in this paper, we argue that actually a sort of we certainly a, a sort of a standard uh, development economics course could go beyond the selective integration to a systematic one. And, uh, and, and that this is feasible and desirable. 
feasible in the sense that we what we propose is a um, low hanging fruit approach that there is already a, a development economics course uh, structured around you know standard topics and uh, and gender content will be added complementing that uh, con uh, content. And uh, we also think that uh, we believe that it's desirable because only through such systematic engagement can a course convey the meaning and relevance of um, uh, development processes in people's lives. So um, what we do in this paper is provide a, a gendered narrative on how to engender uh, such a course. And um, and we do so, uh, we sort of show how uh, gender aware materials, um, uh, yes, <laughs> how gender aware materials and pedagogical tools can complement a course, uh, a standard um, uh, textbook and a set of articles. So our goal is to address these gender gaps in content and, um, and uh, the new content, uh, the articles and the materials we draw upon are um, reflective of uh, the core features of uh, feminist economics. And, 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 and that basically uh, means uh, that um, there is attention to the economy as broader than the monetary economy to, uh, you know, basically unpaid uh, activities are, are, are um, um, uh, part of the provisioning activities uh, uh, under consideration as economic activity. Human well-being is a yardstick of economic progress and success of economic policies. Uh, um, feminist economics also uh, broadens the economic analysis to include uh, political and social processes and power relations and people's efforts, agency to improve their livelihoods. And um, uh, there is uh, clear recognition of ethical objectives as part of the economic framework. And also, uh, last but not least, um, there is sort of attempt to um, pay attention to uh, intergroup uh, differences in terms of class, race, ethnicity, as well as gender, a, a sort of in an intersectional manner that constrain and shape economic outcomes. And uh, so, um, so basically, uh, we propose to engender three main sections of a prototype development economic for economics course uh, that is meanings and measures of economic development strategies uh, uh, of economic for economic development salient issues of development and then we add this forward looking section on creating equitable development Thank you, Gwenzeli. So um, in this part of the presentation, I'm going to give you some examples for practical ways in which one can engender a development economics course using these four suggested um, sections of the course. And as Gwenzeli said, the first section would be meanings and measures of economic development. Um, in the article that goes along, um, with this presentation, uh, we do have uh, a longer text discussion of um, the background and the history of measuring economic development. And then we suggest that uh, when teaching this material, uh, one example of what somebody could do is to present a critique of GDP per capita um, as a measure of uh, development and one could then show what's now a classic film um, uh, based on Marilyn Waring's work on, um, on uh, measuring GDP and, and what gets covered and not covered in the film, who's counting. Um, another, I'm not gonna read all of these examples, um, but in every section, proposed section, we suggest having a monthly shining star a tribute to a feminist scholar uh, who has done research and development and has typically been ignored in mainstream classes. So the first shining star who we suggest 
um, who most people in this Zoom know and love, uh, Nyla Kabir, her work on women's empowerment. And um, there is a link here to um, one of the many videos uh, showing uh, Nyla's work uh, breaking uh, the wall of gender inequality. Now, the second proposed section in a course that um, in, incorporates gender into development co uh, course would be policy strategies for economic development. Um, we do suggest a number of possible videos that one can use throughout the course. In this case, um, two or actually three uh, films that are more macro and gender related and the macro focuses on international trade and especially exports. Uh, China Blue, which I've used a number of times in my class, it's fantastic, uh, about a blue jeans factory, uh, Makilapolis, and then Pins and Needles is a more recent film that um, folks were talking about in the IAFI listserv. Um, in this particular section, our monthly shining star is Stephanie Seguino, who's done a lot of work on macroeconomic issues and inequality and gender. And here she's featured in a video called Who Gets the Bad News of Capitalism? Um, as Gunzeli mentioned, the third proposed section of our course would be salient issues in development from a gender perspective. So here we suggest a number of particular topics that are highly relevant for um, incorporating a gender dimension into a development class. So one example that somebody could do here would be to, um, let's say, discuss the pros and cons of randomized control trials um, and do a case study of an RCT. There's been quite a bit written on microcredit and gender. And we have a suggestion here. And our monthly uh, shining star in this case would be Bina Agarwal and her work on bargaining in the household. And then finally, the forward-looking section that we propose, it, creating equitable development. Um, it's important, I think, that any course now on development um, talks about the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we do provide some uh, sex disaggregated data sources. In the next table, I'll show you, but um, students, could look at the sex dis disaggregated data on COVID and talk about the gendered outcomes of the pandemic. Um, an exercise that I've done in my class is have students, uh, we often do this live in class, um, or I assign uh, a question, a little statistical exercise, having them turn to the World Value Survey database. And there's a ton of interesting information from all around the world based on gender norms and people's beliefs about um, gender, as well as race, ethnicity, religion, uh, political issues. It's really a valuable database. And our shining star in this section is Nancy Fulbray and her work on caring labor. Um, the other thing that we do in our paper is provide some uh, resources to help somebody uh, shape a course that uh, thoroughly incorporates um, gender. Um, it could be a development course is what we're talking about, but a number of these resources can also be used for engendering other courses in economics. So we have some links to sample syllabi. Uh, UN Women has some excellent online modules uh, as part of their training efforts. Uh, we have some film catalogs. Um, one that I love, I think most of us on this call are using um, active learning techniques, and this UNESCO resource has some really interesting and creative teaching ideas for active uh, work in the classroom with our students. And finally, here are some uh, data sets that all have gender disaggregated um, economic and social and demographic uh, indicators. And with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Gunzeli, who will close for us. Yeah. Um, now, um, the, the innovation that we propose, this sort of gender integration and development economics uh, course, um, 
is likely to have two valuable effects. Uh, one is a sort of a, a pedagogical value in terms of teaching development issues. And um, we believe that uh, basically this, this strategy will be effective in students' understanding of economic development, the importance of gender equality and women's well-being in this development process, and also um, uh, understanding of these mediating institutions, uh, communities, government, and markets, and how they impact well-being of individuals as countries grow. Um, and so that's sort of the pedagogical value. And of course, this we uh, propose to do through this sort of um, uh, materials that will hopefully enhance active learning in, in the, in, during the course. The second um, uh, valuable uh, sort of impact, uh, Jana, you can move to the next slide, <laughs> um, is the in terms of the um, in terms of potential impact on gender composition and culture of, of economics. Um, obviously, we are all aware of the persistent gender gaps in our profession. And some of these are perpetu perpetuated through a curriculum that is not gender aware. And, um, and we have the problem of underrepresentation of women among students uh, who take economics courses and who major in economics. Uh, also uh, interrelated with that is the persistent low, persistently low representation of women among economics faculty and Chile. Uh, climate that women economists uh, unfortunately continue to face. Uh, now, as a course with gender content, uh, we believe that a development economics course uh, uh, with a gender extra added uh, gender dimension could be a draw for women economics students. These students might otherwise take a sort of an interdisciplinary gender development globalization course, perhaps from another department, and maybe on that in the course of that, decide that they're going to major in some other, you know, uh, field. So I think we think that this is a this is potentially a valuable part of our, of our project. And uh, but broader than that, I, I mean, this this type of uh, course uh, design will likely to have will likely to appeal to men as well as women to, uh, to just draw additional students. And through that, uh, we believe that uh, prospective students will gain gender awareness that will in turn make the profession and policy making more welcoming to uh, women in the future. So addressing this sort of uh, gender awareness issue in the pipeline, early in the pipeline, could have this sort of broader uh, beneficial effects. Stop it there. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Yana and, and Gunsili. Um, and I don't know if you've seen, but the, the chat is full of appreciation for, for all the stuff that you're doing, everything that you're saying. There were a few questions which I think you've kind of addressed, but we can come back to this afterwards after we talk to Steffi. One was about um, teaching these things or approaching these things from a global south, in the global south or from a global south perspective. And some of the UN stuff, for example, the resources you talked about are global. Uh -huh. But, you know, it's a question, I guess, an open question. Um, I think broader, and then there's a question, I think, from uh, Sarah Smith that I just saw coming in about sort of how gender itself is as a non-binary, I mean, we've talked about it in a non-binary way, right, uh, is received or, or, you know, how you address this uh, and so on, given that there is a huge amount of literature, I think, that, you know, standard kind of literature you can use in an econ course uh, on this. So just that last point, I don't know if you have any quick thoughts on that. Um, <laughs> well, uh... I mean, obviously, uh, this is when we say uh, the sort of the intersectionality, uh, attention to intersectionality of gender and gender in its many forms is uh, sort of important to consider. Now, the literature in um, in um, in the global South uh, 
you know, obviously it's a challenge to try and uh, get to the bi non-binary gender issues in, in the standard development course. I mean, on the whole, this, uh, this project is challenging because you have uh, students generally in the global north who are on who lack the awareness of you know conditions of uh, being low income country uh, to begin with and then we're trying to add gender content to it there is certainly no barrier to diversifying the sort of the 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 content of gender there in terms of uh, you know non-binary as well as uh, you know other uh, other aspects of gender so um, I mean I think the readings we have at the moment are mainly gender as binary but there is no you know obstacle to introducing the uh, a richer concept of gender yeah and I would add to that um you know, I've since written um, a similar piece with Jackie Strenio, whose work on teaching, um, we actually cite uh, one of our exercises uses an idea that Jackie had for doing a little uh, mini film festival with uh, videos that students create. Uh, but Jackie and I since wrote a similar article about engendering a labor economics course. And there, one of the specific special topics we recommend is um, the uh, economics of you know LGBTQ uh, plus issues and especially discrimination in the labor market. But you know, we're Gunzeli and I updating this article. I think I would readily add a special topics on um, uh, issues around LGBTQ uh, plus and um, economic development. You know, using the work of Lee Badgett who has done quite a bit of global work on discrimination against LGBTQ individuals. Um, and Lee and I also did a, an article with Gase Valdyke looking at legal reforms and greater inclusiveness and the impact on GDP growth. And uh, there's been uh, just an explosion of data, I would say in the last year or two, mm -hmm. um, people creating indices of LGBTQ rights, as well as outcomes. And the World Bank just put out an index. So I think we're Gunsali and I writing this article today, we probably <laughs> would use it, this data, these new articles and uh, create a new special topic section uh, on that. Excellent. I, I think there's lots of people taking notes um, in the chat could... me as well. I mean, it, this is very excited. You know, this area is very exciting. We don't have a lot of areas, right? in economics where data collection hasn't happened yet, or it's literally, you know, things are being produced now, uh, you know, areas as in, you know, segments of the population. So that's that's really exciting. Um, I am gonna move over to Steffi, who I have lost my screen now, um, to just stop. I should mention that, uh, I can see Steffi now, excellent. Um, <laughs> uh, that Yana is also a member of uh, CSWEP, so um, the American Economic Association's um, kind of gender, um, committee. Um, Steffi is one of the co-organizers, obviously, of this seminar series, but she's also the Royal Economic Society's diversity champion and has just concluded um, a report, a diversity report, looking at pipeline issues. So school to university, university to, to graduate school um, uh, within economics. Obviously, in the UK, people choose to study a major. So these are economic students as such. Mm -hmm. um, just wondering, Steffi, if you want to come in just to comment on sort of the landscape and also perhaps you know, the things we've been talking about in terms of gendering things that we study. Maybe we should call it regendering yeah. things that we study because the things are gendered. We just didn't study them in that way, perhaps. Um, take it away, Steffi. That's okay. So I'm, I'm going to try to be very brief <coughs> here because I think we are all really learning from the other speakers and I'm a bit of an interlope here. I'm not really teaching gender economics. That's kind of my, my next step to develop a course. I don't think it's going to be ready for next year, but for the future. So I'm learning a lot here. So uh, yes, as Barama said, we just uh, finished the, the um, mm. report on who's studying economics. Well, in the report, we focus on 
a lot on the socioeconomic background of economic students. So we were trying to look at more intersectionality and moving away to just looking like from the gender focus and the ethnicity, but looking at all these components together. I really appreciate that a lot of people in the chat, I'm looking and say, oh, you, you helped me, you gave me comments and, and thank you very much, everybody. Eventually I'm gonna send around an email with the final project. So I can even show you some of the, the results. And I said, this perhaps helps to, uh, yeah, mm. this is a long presentation, so I'm not going to go through all these, but so this is kind of, you can see my screen, right? Yeah, uh, this, you can still see my screen, right? But better. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So this is the part of the pipeline that Parama was talking about that we focus on and is from school who studies economics and the graduate levels and then who graduates in economics. So we haven't looked at postgraduate, we haven't looked any anything further than that. And more or less, we have tried to summarize the results in these graphs here. So, well, you can see in the UK, we have uh, Russell Group Universities, pretty nice, like old universities and modern universities that depending on whether you were founded before 92, after 92, don't pay too much attention to it. But the pink uh, shadow here are the female proportion. And you can see that in the UK, and I have been, I, have, I give a talk to this in Geneva and in Manila, and I also talked to some colleagues from India and everybody said, you know what, this must be a real UK, US situation that we have so few women studying economics. Right. Because Manila, they were 60 percent. In Geneva, they were 50 percent. So it's something that is quite interesting to see why we have so few women in economics in the UK uh, to begin with. Something perhaps for the future. I, I'm not going to give you an answer uh, right now. I don't know. Uh, so, yes, uh, focusing on gender, something that kind of it's very sad in economics. We find it very sad. If you focus on the socioeconomic background, so start looking at the um, intersectionalities of all these things, it's a gray area. So every hundred students, there are hundred little men and women in this thing. Only six of them are from a low socioeconomic background in a Russell Group University. Like this is kind of, if then you look at how many of them are female, there are two of them are female, four of them are male. It, it, it gets quiet. Of course, the more we move into, let's, let's say, lower ranking universities, of course, like that, it's not necessarily the case, but let's say the amount of female decreases. So Russell groups tend to attract more female, but the number of students from lower socioeconomic background increases. So that's just, Something. This is just a focus on Russell Group. We also try to look at where are the leakages, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing on this, but just focus on the A-level leakages in the UK. In the UK, you can study economics at A-level, so when you are 16, 18, you focus on few subjects. You study very few subjects. You can choose economics among these subjects. Not many female study economics at the A level, but we know that even if no one requires economics at level at university, it kind of is quite popular. Students who study A level at economics tend to study econo uh, economics at university. And we also look at those ones who have, have A levels in economics and math because good universities tend to require math as an A level, right? not economics, but math. And you can see that so the problems, the gender problems we have, and this is not new, this already we found in previous literature, Sarah Smith, I think is here, she has found this. So this is really not, not new. We knew that there was this huge leakage problem at school level for female. What we look at uh, is also, okay, we know that not enough as, uh, women study economics at A level, but from those one who studied economics at A level, do they actually end up studying economics at university? And I say, if you look at uh, the first graph, that's by gender, we look, I'm not gonna go through all these things, but if we look by gender, we see that actually female, even if they have A levels in economics, they are less likely to study economics. So that's 
start a leakage there because it's kind of, well, you did study economics A level, but you still don't want to do it. Less when we look at A levels in economics and math. So if you have done both A levels, you are more likely to go and study economics. So kind of that say something. Um, here we have conditional probabilities. We control for a series of things, but we see that in general, females are less likely to study economics at university, even when controlling for various characteristics. So that takes us to kind of conclude that there is a problem in the pipeline for, for gender is that there are not enough girls studying economics A level. And there is this leakage that even when they do have economics A levels, they are less likely than men to study economics. Something that we don't find, we also look at continuation and look at outcomes. We don't find actually significant leakages, gender leakages. There are other leakages in the pipeline, but once females actually do study economics, they do well. They are, they are less likely to drop out of university and they are more likely to get a good degree in economics. Right. Of course, there are differences across universities, but in general, we observe this, which make us conclude that, OK, the problem here is, yes, we have to attract more women at university. Once they are here, usually they do well. There are problems then down the pip pipeline, because we know that then, as some of you have already said, there are not enough women at top position. There are not enough women studying PhDs, et cetera, et cetera. There is some, uh, some literature in, in these uh, areas. We have under the representation, but there is also the problem of uh, gender discrimination. There is also the problem of just having a hostile cult culture in the discipline and various stereotypes. And all this, of course, is going to affect the progression in of women through academia and through other jobs. So I think this is just sort of, as I say, in the, in the, in the report, we focus a lot on, on socioeconomic background. So a lot of our, our outcomes is going to be based on that. But we kind of look at the intersection of socioeconomic background, ethnicity, and gender as well. But I'm going to kind of stop here. And Param, unless you don't remember anything else that I have to say, uh, just leave it there. No, that's that. That's really good. Thank you. And it's it's really interesting that um, I mean, obviously, the selection when there is selection, right? The selection could be such that those are the absolute cream of the crop, and of course, they do well. You know that that kind of issue come, comes in, and so they're you know the bar is higher, you know, something like that. Um, there was a question earlier, which kind of um, is related to the selection issue. Uh, Astrid, if you if I can come to you first uh, with this. So I assume that your course is optional, right? It's not a mandatory um, course. Um, and you did say that uh, there, there were selection issues. So do you want to comment um, on that at all? What, what the general makeup of the student body looks like and who comes into your courses or who goes elsewhere? Yes, yes, it's correct. So the, the course I described is a full course and selective at the master level. It's placed in the strategy man management uh, profile. So, so, uh, but not only students from this this profile will choose. But there are more women in the strategy direction than, for example, in finance, which is very male dominated. It, it varies a bit from year to year. So, I would say like fifty to seventy percent maybe are women. Wow. Okay. Year, so, but then I'm teaching also a course which is not compulsory in the sense you have to only take this course, but I, it covers the ethics requirements students have to cover in the master's uh, studies. It's a 2.5 credit, like a third of a full course. And that varies more from year to year. Uh, so last year, for example, it was 70% men. And I, related to earlier questions, so one focuses on gender, of course, one could also include more other, other um, demographic characteristics, ethnic by, background, LGBT, Q, as, as was mentioned. And also I try to, to do this in the courses, but of course also pointing out that while I focus on gender, because there's so much literature on that, uh, 
so much theory, but of course it's not all one to one. Like if we know, understand the, prop, the, the the theory, the background, why we observe gender differences, we know policy solutions that does not go one to one, even within the same country to address other minority questions or imbalances. So I think this is very important to highlight, but in these courses, then students choose themselves term papers, especially in this, in this elective for business ethics, which then focuses entirely on discrimination and business ethic questions. Then they choose often other minorities, ethnic minorities, or there were also master thesis on LGBT. So I find this very, very rewarding and very interesting then how students go on starting the material of these courses to think of these questions. Great, right, thank you, um, Astrid. Um, Gunsili and, and Yana, if I can come to you with um, kind of general general question that came out um, in the in the chat about, we've been talking about particular courses, right? Teaching about the farm, teaching about development, you can, and you've talked about your motivation for why, you know, why focus on gender within, within development. And there's been a, a, a series of people talking about other kinds of courses, mostly applied, mostly empirical courses and, and gender in there. Um, do you think there's like in, in, you know, standard micro macro or, I don't know, you know, more policy courses, or there's some people in the chat who are in business schools where it's not straight econ courses that they're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, sort of what advice you would give them in terms of how to bring in, you know, gender in, in the way that you've done it in your course. So, you know, you've talked a little bit about macro resources, I think, um, mm -hmm. yeah, no, when, when you were presenting your bit of it. Um, but for people doing other kinds of other kinds of courses, so it's not teaching a new gender course, right? but in the course that I have already, like you've done in your development course. So, and any sort of advice you might and um, have for the, the chat's going so fast, I have can't keep track of it. Lots of people with lots of ideas and lots of questions. Um, maybe I, I can um, give an example, Gunsley, while you think about how to address <laughs> that one. Um, you know, I think just about everyone, there's the selection of who's on this uh, Zoom meeting and this um, workshop, but we all already think with a gendered lens, you know, but I think if one just uh, applies any examples and tries to use um, articles and examples related to issues around um, gender or articles written by um, you know, women and people, um, non-binary individuals, so to have inclusivity also by authors. Uh, but another example of a course that I taught was statistics for feminists. Mm -hmm. So it was a thoroughly engendered statistics course where the textbook um, wasn't feminist by any means, but it was more applied. Um, and every single example that we used related to um, issues around gender. So like wage gap uh, decompositions or wage regressions. And instead of having simple statistical examples about baseball and football, you know, we would do other examples that would interest um, women more. But we, uh, or I should say I, um, when I taught this course, you know, it was just a determination to have all of it be relevant to gender, but still teach a statistics course using um, a non-feminist, non-gendered textbook, but it was more policy oriented as well and more applied. Um, so that would be an example of a statistics course that one can thoroughly engender. Uh, Gunsali, other thoughts? Well, uh, actually, I've been uh, sort of fortunate enough that I've never had to teach a um, in several years. I haven't uh, taught any of the standard courses. I I regularly teach feminist economics and uh, political economy of race, class, gender, which is a sort of an introductory class. Um, so, um, I mean, other than some of the examples of how to integrate into macro sort of GDP critiques, for example, that's a very, again, low hanging fruit type of uh, um, uh, addition. Um, I, so I haven't, I can't think of, you know, how to engender a standard course uh, based on my own experience. 
But one thing we've done at Utah is um, we sort of um, are requiring almost, it's sort of one of three courses that uh, students who are going to enter the major to take this political economy of race, class, gender course as a gateway course into the major. And that seems to be working well. So if students are sort of maybe being put off by intro, micro, and macro, they could be motivated through this entry point of political economy of race, class, gender. So, I mean, I'm, I realize that's a sort of alternative uh, curricular decision, but um, that's an option. <laughs> That's really interesting because as you were speaking, I was, and, and there's been a question that's just come up again, uh, about this, that there's a huge discussion here in the UK about decolonizing the curriculum right. uh, and, and people interpret it in different ways. You know, yeah. it, it, it sometimes means actually imperialism and, you know, mm -hmm. talking about those things sometimes means just being more inclusive and, and things like that. But what you've said is, is really interesting. I mean, we've been going back and forth, right, between gendering a course mm -hmm. or if you're thinking of uh you know in the uk it's easier for us because we have very structured programs mm -hmm. or in the us if you know gateway into the major requiring something that you know it doesn't have to happen in every course but you make sure that if you're in that major you go through exactly some of these <laughs> courses yeah um can i just quickly in, in the little time we have back uh have um come back to you astrid about I think you said it's an ethics requirement. Is that right? Your your court. Can you say a little bit more about that, maybe? Yeah, actually, yeah. This interesting at NHH, we introduced some years ago the requirement for business students or the students at our business school to have a two point five, so it's a third of a full course in business ethics, and it's more specifically uh, somehow related to corporate social responsibility. So two firms. And so the, the course that I offer is on firm diversity and business ethics, which in the end is about teaching, understanding discrimination in labor markets, why it tastes for discrimination, statistical discrimination, unconscious bias can exist, persistent markets, what is this really? And then also thinking it from the firm's perspective. So if you think of it from a firm, and then it boils down to that often can be a or it can be a situation that an employee feels discriminated. It's illegal, so they could in principle take the employer to court, but in practice they will not do that. Either they will change firm or they will stay there. And then the question is what to, is the responsibility of the managers? So in those terms, students of through this course, they get confronted in a kind of from a broader perspective with topics of gender differences or minorities uh, and what, what issues can come, appear in, in work life. What does it look like in work life? Which I think is a nice angle to, to, to drag students towards this direction by making them part of this uh, compulsory. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I know there are several people from business schools, not naming any names here. Um, from UK business schools, let's put it that way. Uh, I'm not sure whether they have ethics requirements of some kind. Um, no, it seems some, some, that would be, that would be a whole different approach to how we teach business school students. Um, Padma, I want right, to uh, interject briefly that um, something I put earlier in the chat, although the chat's been so active, I may repost it in there. You had mentioned um, CSWEP, the Committee on the yeah. Status of Women in the Economics Profession. They have uh, joined forces with the Social Science Resource Council to offer grants for up to $200,000 um, for people to evaluate interventions that increase the representation of um, women in the economics profession at all levels, including teaching. So mm -hmm. I put a link to the call for proposals. There is no deadline. Um, they are um, evaluated on a rolling basis, but these are you know, generous grants that many people in this call may be interested in. And the link has quite a bit of detail about what they are looking for 
and um, how to structure the uh, proposals. So if folks just scroll up a little bit in the chat, um, you'll see the name of the call for proposals and a link to the call. That's fantastic, Yana. I, I did see it briefly, uh, but I think what we'll do, because we've had so many resources in the chat as well, we'll, we'll try to uh, get them together and send it around as an email to, to everyone who was registered as well um, with the resources that would, with, with like the slides and things that were um, that were sent as well. And it's a really nice, we're, we're almost out of time. So um, that's a really nice positive sort of note to, uh, to note to end on. I think we saw in Steffi's um, a presentation that some of the some of the stats, some of the landscape has just not changed. We've learned a bit more about it, but it hasn't changed, which is unfortunate. But if we have funding to look at, evaluate interventions, that that's always um, hopeful. So um, yeah, um, Steffi, I think uh, we've we've put the full responsibility on you to come up with the RES um, uh, funding for for doing something. Uh, here on, on this as well. Um, we are um, almost out of time, so I just wanted to thank all our uh, panelists. Um, for attendees, do look out for our next um, seminar session. As always, we'll send out the, the, the registration will be on our on our page, we'll send out reminders and so on. Uh, if you don't do so already, do follow, follow us on socials, on LinkedIn and on uh, Twitter. Uh, and this will be available obviously on our CTEL YouTube channel where you'll see our previous ones as well. Uh, and like I said, we would we'll, we'll collect all of these. And I'm sure, as always, our panelists are always very happy to, for people to get in touch and uh, connect if, if um, yeah, they have further questions and, and so on and so forth. We may come back to all of you because there seems to be a lot of activity happening to see if we can collect something about resources and what courses people are teaching and what they're learning uh, and, and so on and so forth. So thanks very much, everyone. And bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.